The period referred to as the Reconstruction Era occurred from 1865 to 1877 after the conclusion of the Civil War. The president at this time, Abraham Lincoln, was determined to end the expansion of slavery into the United States. However, Southern Republicans were resistant to these changes and feared that the freeing of slaves would upset the current hierarchy of power and control. It was not until 1865 that Reconstruction could truly begin. The 13th Amendment was ratified, abolishing slavery. Many American citizens especially in the South, did everything that they could to stop the progression towards equality among all races. Southern Democrats' resistance to change, along with the desire to maintain white supremacy, led to the formation of the Ku Klux Klan in 1866. In April of 1867, Klan members gathered in Nashville, Tennessee to discuss their plan for retaliation against Reconstruction policies. This meeting united Klan members, Southern natives mainly from Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, and resulted in the establishment of what the Klan would become, a terroristic organization. The Klan used violence and intimidation as a means for reaching their goals. The lawless methods would eventually lead to the temporary demise of the Klan. In order to suppress political involvement and influence of the, in the black community, Klan members threatened, attacked, and even killed black political figures. In fact, seven black legislators were murdered during Reconstruction. The Klan's lack of structure and barbaric tactics caused the organization to fall apart. However, the destruction of the Klan did not mark the end of white supremacy in the South. Following the Reconstruction Era, feelings of resentment towards African Americans were undeniably present. Columbus became the site of gruesome murders and vicious racism. In 1896, Jesse Slayton, a black Columbus native, was arrested after, after being accused of assaulting a white woman. Local authorities feared that white citizens would seek justice and take matters into their own hands. Because of this false sense of security, Slayton was left unprotected. Jesse Slayton was never given a trial. That morning, a mob of white Columbus residents burst into the courtroom armed with various weapons making it impossible to stop them. Slayton was dragged out of the courtroom and was shot and killed. A noose was placed around his neck and he was dragged from Broadway and 10th Street to Broadway and 11th Street, leaving his body covered in dirt and filth. The mob had fired hundreds of bullets into Slayton's dead body before tying the rope to the limb of a tree and hanging him. Shots continued to be fired until Jesse Slayton was physically unrecognizable. Directly after the murder of Slayton, the same mob attacked and killed Will Miles another black Columbus citizen who had been acquitted of his crimes. Similarly, Miles was shot numerous times and hung from the same tree as Slayton. A sign was placed on the body stating, any Negroes who committed a similar crime will be treated likewise. This extreme violence and degradation of human life represented a deep-rooted hatred of African Americans in Columbus. Ultimately, no one was held accountable for the murder of the two men allowing whites to maintain their dominance over blacks and reinforcing white supremacy.
the poor condition of race relations at Columbus became the inspirations for one of the most progressive authors of the 20th century. In 1917, Lula Carson Smith, more commonly known as Carson McCullers, was born in Columbus, Georgia. As a child, McCullers refused to conform to the social norms. She liked the femininity that women at this time were expected to possess and had no interest in attempting to fit in. Her status in society as a sort of misfit allowed her to empathize with individuals that didn't fit in or discriminated against. At this time, there were few upper class citizens in Columbus. The majority of the population were middle class and typically worked in various mills in the area. With Jim Crow law still in effect, black members of the community were discriminated against in both their personal and work lives. Many establishments were still segregated. They had fewer work opportunities and were not paid as much as white citizens performing the same job. To most people, these conditions of inequality were considered normal and acceptable. However, the college did not feel the same way. Virginia Spencer Carr, a former professor at Columbus State University and the college biographer, stated, Even as a child, she knew intuitively that the blacks were treated as second-class citizens. And sometimes she probed her father with such questions as, Why colored people? had their own drinking fountains and why most fountains said white only. She also wondered why colored people lived in a little brown house and tar paper shacks and seemed so poor, and why white people never worked for colored people. She could never get the answer she wanted. Growing up in Columbus allowed McCullers to witness firsthand unfair treatment of minorities and anyone that was considered out of the ordinary. In 1940, McCullers published her first novel, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. McCullers addressed not only the issue of race relations, but also economic injustice and homosexuality. Because of this, the book was the first of its kind, finally giving a voice to the oppressed. Additionally, it shed light upon the true nature of the South. It was, in McCullers' opinion, a place filled with cruelty, unfairness, and racism. The novel takes place in the state of Georgia in a 1930s mill town very similar to Columbus. The storyline revolves around John Singer, a deaf mute who becomes a friend and confidant to the people in the mill town that feel like outsiders. Because he cannot hear and does not speak, the main characters feel as though they can trust him and tell him their problems and woes. Throughout the book, we are introduced to many different types of misfits. Dr. Benedict Copeland, the only black physician in town, spends all of his time aiding people and trying to make them understand the injustices of the world. He had been educated in the North, but returned to the South in hopes of helping the black citizens in the town. McCullers intended for Dr. Copeland to resemble WACP leader Thomas Brewer, who was assassinated on 2nd Avenue on February 18, 1956. Brewer spearheaded the drive for racial equality in Columbus, Georgia, and is recognized as a martyr of the National Civil Rights Movement. Brewer initiated successful black voter registration drives to Columbus in the late 1940s and early 1950s. He also campaigned successfully for the hiring of black police officers in Columbus. By the late 1940s, Brewer was receiving death threats from hate groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. However, it was his support for racial integration of public schools following the Brown for Sport of Education decision May 1954 that brought him the opprobrium of more moderate white leaders and organizations. Dr. Copeland was a strong advocate for equality in the heart as a lonely hunter. He preached to his people, stood up against racist whites, and served his community as a doctor. Portia, Dr. Copeland's daughter, was another important racial character in the book. She had very limited options as a young black woman in the Jim Crow South, but unlike her father, she didn't fight her place in society. Instead, she finds some level of contentment in that place. Clock Without Hands, McCullough's final novel, was published in 1961 and took place in the 1950s. Here, Carson McCullers made several connections with this book and that time in history. In the story, an old-fashioned and racist judge named Fox Klain tried to persuade his town to resist racial equality. He strongly disliked the North because of the Civil War and wished the South could have kept slavery and Confederate money. In addition, the judge was also a member of the KKK and allowed practices such as neighborhood bombings of black houses. An action known as redlining was very popular during this era, and it kept black families from living in white neighborhoods. As a result, slums and ghettos were becoming popular and larger. In Columbus, this dividing line between black and white neighborhoods was making road. Realtors would even selectively show black families homes in predominantly black and urban areas, systematically keeping whites and blacks separated. Towards the end of the book, the judge led all the white townsmen to rally and bomb the house of a black Black neighbor in a white neighborhood. Many terroristic actions such as this did happen during the 50s and 60s. The end of the book talks about the passing of Brown versus Board of Education 
and the hatred and praise that followed. Fox Klein was furious about the new law and spoke about his anger over the radio to others in the town. 